Hello, what's up guys? It's me, your friend, Tanner Babcock here. Uh, you might have noticed something's new, something's different. <laughs> I have a, I got a new webcam for Christmas and I got this cool color changing light back here. So this is the new Tanner Babcock channel 2.0 where we start to get fancy and I start to look a little more professional, but you know, some things are new and different and some things are the same. Like right now, I'm going to show off my GitHub sponsors profile. That's right. If there's anyone out there at all who would want to sponsor me on GitHub, uh, it's right here. You could choose to give me a custom amount, a one-time payment, or you could choose to give me a, a, a monthly subscription. You could choose to give me $4 a month. You could choose to give me $20 a month. Or you could choose to give me $100 a month. I would really appreciate it because I need some money. <laughs> and uh, if you sponsored me on GitHub, I would definitely work on anything you wanted me to work on. I would be happy to help. I have a... Uh, Lots of knowledge, lots of intelligence. And I'm really capable with web technologies and Rust and C++. So yeah, I would really appreciate it if there was anyone out there at all who would like to sponsor me on GitHub. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, let's get to the video. Now... <clears throat> a few months ago, I made a video called Absolute Beginner's Guide to the Linux Terminal. And the video is about 45 minutes, but uh, I didn't really cover as much as I had wanted to cover in that uh, beginner's tutorial. So that's why I'm making this video, The Absolute Beginner's Guide to the Linux Terminal, Part 2. So, I'm going to cover a lot of stuff that I didn't cover in my first video. If you are a complete beginner to the Linux terminal, which uh, could also be the Mac OS terminal, or it could be a BSD terminal, or you could just type these commands on your, uh, your Android phone. So, if you would like to learn, if you don't already know the the basic basics of the terminal, you should uh, go ahead and check out uh, part one of this series, the original absolute beginner's guide to the Linux terminal. So uh, let's get started. What are some commands we ran in that first video? I think I showed the ls command, um, I showed the cd command. Um, I think I show the touch command, cd video, touch, that's how you create a new file on a Linux file system, you can just touch it. And then you type ls and there's a file.txt. I'm going to show something that a uh, distrotube actually showed in uh, one of his recent videos. This command called timecat which just uh, is like a stopwatch and it just runs this cat's command. So this cat command has no standard input, it has no files to read, so it's just waiting. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to teach you all how to work with processes on Linux. So this cat command is a, uh, a process that's right now, it's like it's hanging. It's not really doing anything, but it's running on your system. It's taking up resources on your system. So uh, what can we do about that? Some Linux systems, if you want to kill a process, you could actually type the command uh, kill all and then the name of the process that you want to kill the process that's hanging, so we are just going to kill this, uh, this cat process right here. I'm going to type kill all cat. And on my Linux system, see, I don't have that command. 
uh, a lot of Linux systems out there, and I think Mac OS has this command too, will have this kill all command. And uh, what that does is it kills the process with the given name. I don't have that command, but another way to do that is you could type p kill process kill with a, a dash x option and uh, then you type the name of the process so I'm going to type cat right here and I'm going to press enter and as you can see the name of the process that was hanging in this terminal was called cat we were timing the cat command I sent this uh, this kill signal to this cat command and uh, that commands over now and it prints out that's what the time command does is uh, it just times a command and then it tells you how long it took how much time was spent on that process so if you run time cat it's just essentially a, a stopwatch But yeah, let's try that again. Let's try another time cat. And uh, <clears throat> I think I showed this program at the end of the first uh, Absolute Beginner's Guide top. It's not showing us the names of the processes right now, but uh, I want to get the process ID, also known as the PID of this uh, this cat command that's running in this terminal right here. So how do I do that? I'm just going to type p grep, which is like uh, the grep command, except it searches the the list of currently running processes. I'm going to type p grep cat, and it looks like there's two cat commands running. Those are the PIDs of them. One of them has the PID 8120, and the other one has the PID 13406. So uh, I'm pretty sure it's the new, the, the newer command. But you can kill a, a hanging process like this. You can just type kill. The command p kill uh, dash x can take a, uh, the process name, but the command kill, just K-I-L-L -L like that, only takes uh, a PID. So I'm going to give it 13406. And I'm going to press enter. And as you can see, that cat process running in this terminal over here has been terminated. So, Remember these commands. Remember uh, p kill or p kill x if you want to kill a process uh, by its name. If you know the name but you don't know the PID, you can type p grep or like p grep pulse audio will tell me the PID of my pulse audio daemon. Uh, p grep uh, OBS will tell me the PID of OBS that's running right now. Uh, P grep sway. Oh, looks like there's three different sway processes. I don't know. <laughs> that's not good. I might have to kill one of those. I'm not going to try that right now. But yeah, I think I showed the grep command. Uh, in the first video, but in case I didn't, I will show that command again. So now this is just a vanilla generic bash shell that I am working in right now. Uh, bash is the default shell, a widely adopted choice for the default shell in uh, lots of Unix and Linux systems as well as Mac OS. So that's why I'm using it. There's no customizations, there's no aliases, so that should tell you that everything that I type into my bash, bash shell will also work for you when you type it into your bash shell. Um, 
But yeah, let's look at this grep command. Let's type ls. I'll look at all of the files in my home directory. Um, now, this really doesn't show me all of the files. If you want to actually see all of the files, you would type ls-la. <clears throat> now, uh, let's look at one of these files. We could look, we could cat my zshrc, which is my configuration for my Z shell. So I'll type that, and what that does is just, it just uh, echoes the entire file. If you type cat and then the name of a file, it will just print the contents of that file. So here's my zshrc right here. But uh, let's say I wanted to look up, I forgot all of my aliases that I had set for the git command. Now, if I want to look up exactly what command is set to what, I could cat zshrc, note the period, the dot zshrc, and I'm going to type a pipe. And what this pipe does is uh, it tells the shell to redirect the output of one program uh, into the input of another program, the standard output to the standard input, to be specific. So uh, I'm going to cat this file, and then I'm going to type this pipe symbol, and then I'm going to type grep. And the string that I'm going to grep is a uh, git. So. Any lines uh, in my zshrc that have the string git, grep is going to print those lines. So these are all of my aliases that I have uh, for my different git commands. So that when I work with git repositories, I don't have to strain my fingers. I just set these aliases. You know, and I can just type GC for git checkout, or a GA for git add. But that's what the grep command does. Um, what about another file? If you want to look at the files in a, a given directory that's not your current directory, you can just type ls, and then I'll type bin. And those are all of my uh, scripts just various scripts for miscellaneous purposes that I need to use for one reason or another. I'm going to cd into that bin directory. And I'm going to open up one of these files with nano. Um, I'll open up ssway. So what this script is, this is my sway launcher script. So when my computer boots and I log in, I just have a, a regular TTY. I don't use a display manager. And then I'll just type S sway. And that will run this script and start the sway Wayland compositor that I'm using right now. And as you can see, I have that pkill command right here that I was just talking about to uh, kill some of the processes that might be that might be hanging, that might be left over from something else. Uh, I try to put pkill in a lot of my scripts to kind of contain my system to make sure there's not a lot of zombies, is what they're called. Zombies. Yeah. <laughs> Still getting used to this new, uh, this new webcam. It is recording the sound through my new webcam, so I hope everything sounds all right. People complain about the sound sometimes. Uh, I hope no one complains about this video. Someone will probably complain that, you know, <laughs> those, those lights are color changing. It's too cool. It's too interesting. It's distracting me from learning and I can't learn now with distracting lights. <laughs> <clears throat>
But yeah, let's write one of these scripts. I'll show you all how to write a shell script. So let's just type nano. We'll call our script uh, script.sh. Now when you uh, start writing a shell script, the very first line of the file of a shell script has to start with this, uh, this pound sign and the exclamation mark. And then if this is a bash script, we are going to type slash bin slash bash. What that's called is a shebang. Every shell script in the world, the first line of those files is the shebang. And that tells the shell uh, basically what interpreter to use. What program is going to receive the, the contents of this script as, a, as its input. So we can just start off with something simple, just type echo hello world. And uh, that's all our script is going to do. It's just going to echo this one string. I'm going to type control X to uh, exit nano. And I'm going to type Y. I'm going to press enter. And that saved our shell script. Now when you write a shell script, you have to uh, make it executable. Because right now, script.sh, you can do lsl. Yeah, if you look at the permissions over here in the output of lsl, script.sh does not have the x. There are no x's right here. So it does not have the, uh, the executable permission. So to give a file the executable permission, to make a file executable, you are going to want to type chmod plus x, and then uh, the name of the file you would like to execute. So I'll type script.sh. Now if I type lsl again, script.sh, that file looks different. And if you look at the, at the permissions over here, you can see there is now an x in those permissions, noting that this file is an executable script. So how do we run our, uh, our new shell script? You run any shell script with a dot and a slash and then you type the name of your script script.sh and then I'll press enter and that echoes the command hello world that just runs uh, this command right here echo hello world <clears throat> and that's all that script does so you need this dot slash <laughs> you can't just type script.sh. I think on Windows you could just type script.bat <laughs> or script or script.exe and it will run the, the batch file or the executable that's in the current working directory. But on Unix, Linux, Mac OS, you got to have that dot slash to tell your shell, to tell bash to run this uh, script that's in the current working directory. Because if you just type script.sh, it's going to say command not found. <laughs> yeah, what else could we put in our shell script? I'll show you a few other commands. Here's a nice command, a uh, host name. That just prints the, uh, the name of your, your computer. So I'll add that line to my script and press Control X, and then I'll press Y, and I'll press Enter again. And to clear my terminal, I can type clear. You can also press Control L, and that clears the terminal as well. But now let's run that script again. Dot slash script dot sh. 
So it printed hello world and then it printed thing because that is the host name of my computer, just thing. <clears throat> if you want to find out the version of your kernel or uh, the details of your operating system, you can type uname. Just typing uname will just tell you Linux. <laughs> I think it says uh, Darwin on Mac OS if you type uname, but you can type uname and give it a uh, hyphen A and it will give you the full version string of your operating system. <laughs> but uh, let's go into my video directory. I'll type ls. And there's just a file.txt in here, so I'm going to go back out into my home directory with cd space dot dot. And uh, I'll type ls again. Now, I want to move my, my newly made shell script into my video directory. So to do that, we are going to use the mv command. Going to type mv script.sh. That argument is for the, uh, the source file. And the second argument to mv is the directory where I want to move this file. So I will go ahead and type this, mv space script.sh space video. And I'll type enter, and then I'll type an ls. And as you can see, that file script.sh is no longer in my home directory. It's in my video directory. So if I type cd video and type ls, there's my shell script. And I can type cat script.sh and it will print the, the contents of my shell script. Now, uh, you use the command mv to do two things. You can do it to uh, move a file to a different directory on the file system or you can also use it to change the name of that file. And uh, really, when you think about it, I mean, that's kind of the same thing. Moving a file, renaming a file. Uh, the operating system is just editing the, the metadata in the file system. You know, it, you know, based on the mv command, it will either change the file name or the name of the directory where the file is stored. But moving a file and renaming a file are basically the same thing. If I wanted to type mv script.sh and then a new name.sh and type that, and then I type ls here. As you can see, our file script.sh has been renamed to new name.sh. I can cat new name.sh and it's that same file. Now to copy a file, <clears throat> you're going to want to use the cp command. cp for copy. If I want to copy my uh, script and make a copy of it, just type cp new name dot sh to uh, I'll call it script dot sh again and then I'll type ls and now there's three files in this video directory one of them is file dot text one of them is new name dot sh and one of them is script dot sh Now, if, uh, if I wanted to move one of these files back out, back into my home directory from my video directory, because that's where I am right now. I'm in slash home slash Babcock slash video. If I wanted to move one of these files out, you could just type uh, mv script.sh 
dot dot. Just the name of a directory. If the second argument to MV is uh, an existing name of a directory, it will move that file into that directory uh, with the same name. So I'll type that, and then I'll type ls again. And that file script.sh is gone. Where did it go? cd dot dot. Dot dot is where it went. I'll type ls, and there's script.sh again. Now, uh, mv and cp, if you wanted to, you could give those some command line uh, options. So if I wanted to type mv and then give it the dash v option for verbose, that means verbose output, it will print stuff to the standard output, mv-v script.sh, I will move that back into the video directory. So I'll type that. And it prints this little, uh, this status here. Renamed script.sh to video slash script.sh. So that's really handy if you, uh, I mean, you can just type stuff like that. You could even do, uh, here, let's go into the video directory. There's script.sh, as you can see. If I wanted to do that again, here, let's say I want to move new name.sh into the parent directory, my home directory, under a new name, and I will call it script.sh. I'll type ls. Now there's just one script in here, script.sh. I will go back into my home directory and type ls here. And there's script.sh. Here's another uh, command line option for MV and also for CP. You could type MV with the V option, and you could also give it the I option, which is uh, in, stands for interactive. Let's say I want to move script.sh back into my video directory. And see, that's the thing. There's already a file in uh, my video directory called script.sh. So that's what this I option does, is it, uh, it will prompt you. It will prompt the user, do you want to overwrite this file? Because it has the same name. Without this I option, this command would have just overwritten the script.sh. So now I'll just type Y, and then it will print a renamed script.sh to video slash script.sh. Go into video again, and I'll type LS. And now there's just one file there because I overwrote one file with another file. These two files are exactly the same. Script.sh. If you want to remove a file or delete a file, that command is rm for remove. So I'll type rm script.sh and I'll type enter. And I'll type ls. That file is gone. <laughs> now let's say you want to remove an entire directory. Well, how do you do that? We could just try to rm the uh, video directory. Just type rm video, see what happens. And it's going to give you this error. It's going to say rm cannot remove video is a directory. Well, we have this other command rmdir, you know, see if that works. rmdir video. And it's going to give you rmdir failed to remove video, directory not empty. 
So the video directory still has a file in it. It still has that file.txt inside of that directory. So if you want to remove an entire directory that has stuff in it, that has files and stuff in it, the command that you want is rm space dash rf and then the name of the directory that's not empty, which is video. <clears throat> so I'll type that. And it didn't print anything in, a, in the Linux shell. If you type a command and press enter and it just doesn't print, any errors or anything, uh, it's safe to assume that the command ran successfully. If there was a problem, it would have told you <clears throat> that there was a problem. And I'll type ls here. And yeah, that video directory is gone. It was deleted. I still have videos, but that directory that I was working in was just called video. So what else could we do? What else could I show you? Um, I'm going to look at this document just for a reference. This is my website here, TannerBabcock.com. I really think everyone out there should check out my website. It's going to be the first link in the, the video description. But uh, if you go to the home page of my website and then go to Linux, and then click on basic unix slash linux shell commands. This is a very comprehensive guide that shows you how to uh, pipe, redirect, standard input, standard output, uh, append. Here's a command I could show you. So let's say we run a command that just has a lot. <laughs> has a lot of stuff. Like when I did a cat.zshrc. Now that's a long, I mean, that's a lot of output. So what can we do here? You probably, you know, if you're looking at a big file like this, you don't need to see the entire file <clears throat> just printed into the standard out like that. So what we can do is we can type cat.zshrc and we can pipe this into a pager. So I'll type space, and then I will add the pipe symbol, which if you remember what I said earlier, that pipe symbol uh, redirects the standard output of one program into the standard input of another program. I'm going to type less, because that is the name of our pager. And so now what's this? Uh, the prompt is gone. This is, a, this is an interactive program called Less, and it's called a pager. And the purpose of this program is very simple. It just lets you uh, interactively scroll up and down uh, through your standard input. <clears throat> and it's not just for, you know, catting a file into less. You could also cat, you know, a long log file. You could run some other command that has a lot of output, and if you need to look at all of that output, uh, you can just pipe whatever you want into less. Here's another command that's handy. You could type a wc and then give that the name of a file, .zshrc. What WC does is it counts the number of uh, lines, right? Lines, words, and characters, or bytes, of a text file. <clears throat> so that ZSHRC is uh, almost 17 kilobytes, and it has 405 lines. That could be really handy to know. What are some other programs? I showed ping in the last video, pinggoogle.com. So that's cool. Um, if you have an external drive, I will actually be right back and I will grab my uh, hard drive and I will show you all how to mount and unmount an external drive on Linux. 
so that you can access some of those files. Give me just one second. So yeah, I'm here. I got my uh, external hard drive, external solid state drive. And let's say if you have one of these or you have a, an iPod or a phone or you know something like that, a memory stick, reader, some USB device that you're going to want to have to you know, plug into your computer and access the files that are on there. I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to take this and plug it into my laptop. Now, when you first plug it in, nothing happens. On Windows or Mac, you plug in an external device and you'll see some type of pop-up. Hey! You, you plugged in a thing. What do you want to do with this thing? <laughs> and if you want your computer to act like that, uh, you shouldn't use Linux. <laughs> you should go back to Windows or Mac OS if you want your computer to be, hey, <laughs> click on me, do this. So you plug in your device. Uh, nothing happens immediately. You could type DF which is the uh, utility that shows you your free disk space. It just shows you some numbers there. So if you type DF and give it the slash uh, dash H option, it will print uh, the free or remaining disk space in a human readable format. So as you can see, I have 6.9 gigabytes left on my, uh, my internal laptop drive. And, uh, but it's not showing our, our external drives. So the first thing you're going to have to do is you have to find the, the device file of your external drive. So you'll have to type ls slash dev. And yes, you are going to have to find which one of these files is your external drive. Fortunately, I already know what my drive is going to be. It's going to be uh, right here, SDA, SDA and SDA1. If I had a traditional hard drive in my uh, laptop, then SDA would be the, the hard drive that I boot from. But that is actually something else. That is actually NVMe O N1. So because of that SDA isn't taken and uh, my external hard drive the file path for that is slash dev slash SDA1. So if your main if you're if you've installed Linux and uh, you have a traditional hard drive SDA is going to be your hard drive that you boot from. Or you would have SDA1, that could be your boot partition. SDA2, that could be your root partition. And then your external drive would show up on SDB instead of SDA. But for me, because I have an encrypted solid state drive on my laptop already, SDA1 is my external drive. So uh, you're going to want to make this folder if it doesn't exist already. And if you, you can actually do that with make dir dash p, this will make the full, this will make a full file path even if none of those directories currently exist. I will just type slash mount slash drive. So just in case the slash mnt directory doesn't already exist, uh, it's going to make that, and then it's going to make another directory inside of that called drive. So if I type ls slash mount slash drive, should be totally empty, right? Nothing there. It should just be an empty directory. This is going to serve as our mount point for our external drive. So now we're going to have to type the sudo command. The first time you run the sudo command, it might give you a warning message. It might try to scare you. It might say, uh, this incident will be reported. <laughs> so uh, you're going to want to figure out how to add your user to the sudoers file. I'm not going to show how to do that right now. 
Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of videos and tutorials. You could just Google add user to sudoers file. <laughs> Something like that. You type sudo. Sudo is the command that you need to type uh, if you need root or super user privileges to run a command. So like if I just wanted to type mount, that's the command mount slash dev slash sdb1 and then that mount point that we made slash mount slash drive. It's going to give you this message must be super user to use mount. So if you get an error like that or you get an error that says a uh, operation not permitted or insufficient privileges you could type a uh, sudo. You're just gonna wanna type that exact same command but you're gonna put sudo before it. So I will type sudo mount dev sdb1 slash mount slash drive. I will type my password here. It's gonna ask you for your password. Special device sdb. Oh, I'm st I just talked about this. It's sda for me. sudo mount dev sda1 mount slash drive. And it did it. I mounted my, uh, my external hard drive. To check and make sure my device has been mounted, I'm going to type DF, the disk usage utility again. Oh wait, DF-H actually. But it's there. This very last line of the DF command says slash dev slash SDA1 and it looks like I have 15 gigabytes available and uh, 451 gigabytes used of a uh, slash mount slash drive. So now my, uh, my file system has been mounted and it has been added to the overall hierarchy of the file system. So I can go into slash mount slash drive and I'll type ls and there's stuff there. That's what's on my external hard drive. You know, I have all my music there. I have all my videos there. Type CD videos, type LS. There's all my uh, movies and stuff, but yeah, now I'm in my hard drive. <clears throat> and uh, if you wanna make any changes, it's not always like this. But for me, when I work on my external hard drive, it's almost always like this. You're going to have to use the sudo command to make any changes whatsoever. Even if I just wanted to type touch file.txt, it's going to tell me permission denied. So if it tells you that, you just type sudo touch file.txt. And then I'll type ls, and file.txt is right there. <clears throat> so there's df, df-h again. Yeah, I still have a good 15 gigabytes of free space. Anyway, when you're done working on your, uh, your mounted external drive, external device, we already mounted it with the, the sudo mount command. And, uh, now you can't just rip it out. You can't just yank it out, you know. You have to do the, on Windows, it would be, you would click the little arrow, and you would click uh, safely remove hardware. Well, this is the same thing, just the Linux version. Instead of typing sudo mount, you would type sudo u mount. And then you would type the, uh, the mount point that you chose to mount your external drive to. I chose slash mount slash drive. And I'm going to go ahead and type that. But I got a, an error. You know, I typed sudo. So what's the, it says target is busy. See, that's my current working directory. 
I'm in the slash mount slash drive directory and the operating system will refuse to unmount this device if, uh, you know, if there's anything happening with it at all. And so since my shell is in this directory, it's refusing to unmount the device. So yeah, if you get uh, an error like that that says target is busy, just make sure nothing is going on. There's no processes that are, you know, working on your external drive. I'm going to change my directory back to my home directory, and then I'm going to try to run that command again. In bash and in most shells, you can uh, go back to previously typed commands with uh, the up and down arrows. So that's what I'm typing right now. And I will go back to this sudo umount slash mount slash drive command. Press enter. And uh, it did it. It didn't print anything, so that means that it unmounted the external drive. And I will type df space dash h again. And as you can see, my, uh, my slash mount slash drive is no longer there in the df output. But uh, there's some other ways we can trim. We can trim a long output or a long file. So we were just doing that cat.zshrc. We did that, we piped it into less. It showed you how to use the pager less. So this lets you scroll, interactively scroll up and down with a file. But what if you just want like the first 10 lines of the file and that's it? How do you do that? Well, I'll show you how to do that. It's a nifty utility called head. We're going to type cat dot zshrc and then I'm going to insert the pipe symbol and then I'm going to just type head and we'll see what happens so that just printed uh, it printed my little thing here and it printed just a few lines 10 lines exactly is what the head command prints of its, uh, its standard input I could also do this command like this. I could just type head.zshrc. And that does the same thing. If I wanted more or less than 10 lines, I could do a cat.zshrc space the pipe. And then I'll type head. And then I'll give it a, another command line option. I'll give it dash 1.5 for 15 lines, and I'll press enter. And that prints a little bit more of the beginning of my .zshrc file. There is also the command tail, which does the opposite of the head command. I think you can imagine what the tail command does. cat.zshrc, there's the pipe, and I will type tail. And yes, that prints the bottom 10 lines of the standard input. So those are the bottom 10 lines of my zshrc. I could also just type tail.zshrc, and that does the same thing. If I want to specify how many lines I want it to show, cat.zshrc. And uh, type tail dash uh, 15. And it will print out the last 15 lines of that file. Well, anyway, guys, that's all I'm going to be teaching today. Uh, thanks for watching my videos. I really appreciate it. I hope you all enjoy the new setup, my new webcam, my new lights and stuff. Here's my, uh, here's my handy reference guide, the basic 
Unix slash Linux shell commands. I highly recommend all of you out there who have watched my first video of this series and this video to uh, check out this document that's on my website, tannerbabcock.com. Uh, there's a lot of commands and a lot of examples here and a lot of stuff that I didn't get to today in this video, but uh, I hope there's someone out there who learned something. I mean, even an old Linux veteran who didn't know about the control L to clear the screen. <laughs> I, hope, I hope someone like that learned how to do something in this video. And uh, uh, just let me know. Just let me know if my video helped you. Here's my uh, GitHub sponsors one more time. I'm just going to show that one more time. I would really appreciate some money if you appreciate my work, if you enjoy what I do. Uh, please sponsor me on GitHub. I have Patreon too, and there's also a direct link for my PayPal. If you just want to give me some money on PayPal, uh, I would really appreciate that. So yeah, there's my GitHub. Here's my website, tannerbabcock.com. And uh, I had a good time. Thanks for watching, everyone. Peace.